Hey guys, welcome to The View from the Front. My name is Stan and this is the January 25th edition. Hope everyone's doing great out there from wherever you're joining us from. Uh, we got a ton to cover in tonight's episode, so I can't wait to get into it. But first, if this is the first time you've ever heard my voice or come across the show, let me tell you just real quickly what we're doing. Every episode, I try to do three things. First, I try to cover hot spots that are happening around the world. Secondly, I try to help unite the country, make you feel a little bit better, a little bit more optimistic about the country's future. And then at the end of each episode, I share some motivation and inspiration because we all need that. And in all honesty, I feel like if you listen to a single episode and it doesn't affect you, if you don't feel a little bit more informed about a military and news happening out there that you haven't heard about all week in the news, because frankly, the media does a terrible job covering this stuff, if by the end you aren't a little bit more positive about our country and its future, and if by the end you're not a little stronger in your own emotional and mental fortitude, then I feel like I fell a little short. So those are the things we're trying to do, and we're going to get straight into the news because there is a ton, ton, ton of things that I want to try to squeeze in to the episode today if I can. All right, so we're going to begin with U.S. news as always and I wanted to cover one piece of sad news to at least start the show. Uh, we mentioned in the last episode that there were a couple of Navy SEALs who were missing. And at that point, it was starting to look like they probably were not going to be found. And unfortunately, that is the case. The Navy has released their names. Uh, I will just mention their names. Of uh, The first one is Christopher J. Chambers who was 37, and then Nathan Gage Ingram, who's 27. Unfortunately, after 10 days of search and rescue operations, they were not found. As I mentioned in last week's episode, they were conducting boarding operations, and while uh, ascending a ladder, one of them fell, and then the other one, to help aid his swim buddy, jumped as well and unfortunately neither were found so i read some about the rescue operations and it covered literally thousands of miles but they did not find either of them so that that's really sad news i've got a link to that story in the episode notes if you want to take a look at that they did as part of some of the details released about that mission they did find all kinds of ballistic and cruise missile parts on that ship, including uh, warheads, propulsion uh, systems, guidance systems. So they did find some stuff on that ship. So, uh, if, you know, if, you, if you're the praying kind, it's probably worth saying a prayer for their families. I know that uh, those gentlemen were doing what they loved doing, and anyone who serves, of course, raises their hand and and puts their life on the line, but it's still it's still sad news. I did so I did want to start the show by mentioning and honoring them, and um, we're gonna stay on that topic as we move to the next bit of news. Now, of course, all of this is involved in the Middle East and with the Houthis, and the Houthis are in a part of Yemen. And um, they control quite a bit of the country. Yemen has been in a civil war for a number of years. And, of course, the Houthis are uh, Iranian-backed. And since the last episode, airstrikes have continued against the Houthis. As you've probably heard in the news, the Houthis have been firing missiles at civilian ships of multiple countries uh, ever since the war in Gaza broke out between Israel and Hamas. There have been a lot of strikes since the past episode, and the Defense, Apart Defense Department um, stated that more than 25 Houthi missile launch and deployment facilities have been destroyed, more than 20 missiles actually destroyed on the ground. These are those long-range ballistic missiles or cruise missiles, and that they've also hit some unmanned aerial vehicles. They've also hit some radar and air surveillance capabilities, and they've even hit some weapons storage areas. So now the Houthis remain completely committed to this fight. They have been fighting for almost 10 years in Yemen, so they are definitely devoted to the cause, but it's a pretty one-sided fight, despite the fact that Iran is assisting them. 
Now, another story I mentioned last week involving U.S. military personnel was an attack on uh, Al-Assad Air Base. Now, I mentioned last week that social media had stated that the air base was hit, but then that never really made the news, and so I said, well, it looks like maybe it wasn't. Well, since the last episode, the Defense Department has confirmed that there were strikes on Al-Assad Air Base in Iraq. Now, of course, U.S., there's about 2,000 troops in the U- in uh, Iraq. But the Defense Department stated it was one of the largest scale ballistic missile attacks to date that has been carried out by Iran-backed militias in Iraq. Uh, two U.S. service members were diagnosed with traumatic brain injuries, so... That's kind of like when in Afghanistan or Iraq there would be those IEDs or improvised explosive devices that go off near someone. It can create concussions or other brain-type injuries. But apparently these may not have been that serious as the the two folks were have already returned to duty. So hopefully they're not too bad off. Uh, these attacks, again, have been confirmed and... The Defense Department did say that multiple ballistic missiles and rockets that targeted the base were intercepted by the air base's defenses, which were probably Patriot missiles. The uh, One final thing, you can read a little bit more in the link in the episode notes, but I did want to mention that the Defense Department said that the use of powerful ballistic missiles were far rarer than the rockets or one-way attack drones that have typically been happening So this was kind of a more serious attack by the Iranian-backed militia in Iraq. Now, as if you're just tuning in for the first time, I've talked about in the past how Iran has a number of militias and groups that it funds and arms and trains. The Houthis in Yemen, there are some in Iraq, there are some in other parts of the Middle East, but as far as these in Iraq, this was apparently a more serious attack. Now, the U.S. military has already conducted airstrikes in retaliation, and the Defense Department has said that they have struck three different facilities that are used by these Iranian-backed uh, Qatab Hezbollah militia group. They said that they targeted a headquarters, a storage, and a training location. So they've struck back, not sure how many people they've injured, but again, just the same way with the Houthis. It's a pretty one-sided fight if we choose to strike and strike hard. As you can hear from many different folks, whether it's the State Department or like the spokesperson for the Department of Defense, the U.S. is doing everything it can to not escalate. No one in the U.S. military wants a fight with Iran right now. And as I've said in previous episodes, Iran clearly doesn't seem to want to fight against either the U.S. or Israel as well. And that's because Iran has made a lot of progress on some of its nuclear facilities and nuclear production. And I think Iran knows that if they were to get in some kind of confrontation with us, we would absolutely set them back many years on their attempts to get some type of uh, improved nuclear production. Two other quick things before we move away from this, this very topic. The first is, I've got a link in the episode notes that the 5th Fleet commander said that Iran is, quote, very directly involved in those ship attacks that are happening in Yemen from the Houthi rebels. And so I did want to mention that. And then the final thing, the longtime listeners know that I've said for months now that I did not think that Iran and the U.S. would get into war over this mess that's happened in Israel where Hamas attacked Israel on October 7th. And of course, the media tried very hard to scare everyone because they needed ratings and ad dollars. And so the media really has hyped this up. And the entire time I've said, I don't really think it's going to happen. I think Iran has too much to lose. So they may use these smaller groups like the Houthis and their groups in, in Iraq. They've got some in Syria. They've got some in Lebanon. But I don't really think they're going to do anything that can be directly linked to Iran because they don't, they like, they're like the bully that talks a good fight but knows that they can't really win. And I wanted to just share one bit of information that kind of confirms that. 
Michael Hayden, who is the former director of the CIA. So this is a guy who's well-versed in international affairs, keeps up with it, has sources in intelligence, has a background with some of the most classified information that you can possibly get your hands on. He actually said on Wednesday of this week, or today as I'm recording the podcast, but on Wednesday the 24th, that in his estimation, there was only a one in five chance of actual conflict with Iran. So a one in five chance or 20% chance. So that's still pretty low. So despite the fact that from time to time, the media will put up the flashing graphics and warn of some kind of war with Iran, I have felt the chances were fairly remote. And now someone who has far more credentials than me is saying the same thing. So airstrikes are probably going to continue in Yemen against the Houthis. There will probably continue to be limited attacks against U.S. forces in Iraq in which we counter or do airstrikes against, but doesn't look like it's going to escalate too bad. So if you've got any friends who are super worried about that, you can let them know or direct them to this episode. At least with everything that I'm seeing and reading and hearing, I, I, I stay, I'm in this, you know, the same boat that I was in all the way back in October, you know, four or five months ago, which is that I just, I do not think a conflict will happen. I think Iran has way too much to lose. And I think, honestly, there are a lot of people in the U.S. military and the Defense Department who've been waiting for a long time to potentially set back Iran and their nuclear production. And so if Iran were to give the opportunity to escalate, I have no doubt that the Plans are already in place to bomb some of those mountain facilities where they're doing nuclear production. So, again, it seems to me like nothing's changed their situation as far as a conflict escalating directly with Iran seems pretty remote. All right, so I have one last piece of U.S. news before we shift to Ukraine, which there are a lot of stories I want to just move quickly through regarding Ukraine. But the Department of Defense did announce some good news regarding uh, the the Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin. Uh, They released on that he has been released from the hospital on Monday after spending two weeks. Of course, we talked about the situation he went through where he had prostate cancer and some complications from that. He kept that secret from the president. And since then, of course, that was a huge media kerfuffle and Even the inspector general has launched an investigation into that to see if protocols were followed. They clearly probably weren't. I have a couple of three weeks ago said my piece on that and I I think rightly kind of lashed out at what was clearly a, a, a mistake on his part. But as I said then, I'm a huge fan of him. And so I'm doesn't appear as though the president's going to request his resignation or that he is going to resign, which is great news. We don't need confirmation hearings now. Too much going on, and he's done an incredible job, as I laid out a few episodes ago. Uh, some good health news that the Department of Defense did share was that he'll be working from home as he recovers, and the doctor said that um, his strength is rebounding, he's making good progress, and Even better news is that the cancer was treated early and his prognosis is, quote, excellent. So that is certainly great news for a a great gentleman who continues to serve his country, who's a retired general who'd put in 30-something years serving in the Army, deployed multiple times, led lots of troops in combat. So great news there. I know, and I share the military stuff because I get very frustrated that people will sometimes in attacking people so much and our politics is so ugly that we forget that these are men and women in high positions often who have served our country for decades, not making a lot of money, being deployed a lot, being away from their family. And I think we dehumanize them and I, that really frustrates me. So any chance I can get to rehumanize people or officials to listeners, I try to do so that we will soften how we discuss things that are happening out there on social media because these are real people 
And it's not fun to be attacked on social media. I don't think I have to belabor that point. All right, so we're going to move to the subject of Ukraine, which is, of course, a topic that's very close to my heart. The news, the first couple of stories I'm going to share are kind of negative or low. It's, it's, it's not good news, the first couple I'm going to share. And I'll go into a little bit of detail why I hope that they're slightly being, I guess, not exaggerated, but overstated. And then we'll go into what is lots of good news that kind of counters it. So if you can just hang with me for just a moment, we'll get past the not-so-good part. That first story, which is part of that not-so-good part, involves President Biden gave a behind-closed-doors briefing with some congressional leaders and what the media is calling a grim assessment of what would happen in Ukraine if they don't get more aid. And it's President Biden said it's incredibly stark, was a direct quote, on what could happen. Let me just share just a couple things from that story. And I've got the link to the story with lots more details if you want to get into it in the episode notes. So President Biden told lawmakers in a private meeting that if Congress fails to authorize additional military aid for Ukraine in the coming days, Russia could win the war in a matter of weeks, months at best. And that's according to two people who are familiar with the meeting. So the President Biden told Congress that if we don't authorize additional military aid, Russia could win the war in a matter of weeks or months at best. Let me go a little bit more into the story before I share my thoughts on that. So the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, and then the Director of National Intelligence, told the lawmakers that Ukraine will run out of certain air defense and artillery capabilities in the coming weeks. So obviously the President Biden summed it up as incredibly stark, which was of course what the media is using in their headline, and that the future of Ukraine aid has never been more uncertain. And this is terrible news because as I've been saying since about last November, I kept thinking that maybe there was a chance we could get this through since a small majority of Republican lawmakers support getting more aid to Ukraine since 90% of the money stays in the U.S. for production for U.S. jobs since most of it's older U.S. equipment. The amount of reasons for wanting to do this are almost overwhelming. I kept thinking that it would perhaps get through. And it was tied to Israel aid as well, which is a very popular Republican priority, and was also tied to border aid or border security, and so it seemed like this was something that could get through, but here we are three weeks into January, and it hasn't gotten through, so that's very worrisome. On the flip side, I feel like that um, it's an overstatement to say that Ukraine will fall in weeks or months, and so it frustrates me that I feel like the president is probably overhyping what might happen. The Ukrainian people have shown unbelievable resolve, and they clearly, every bit of additional modern weaponry weaponry from the West is a great thing. But they were holding off the Russians without a ton of U.S. equipment more than a year ago, just through pure courage and valor. And so I don't like to scare people. And so those words from the administration frustrated me just a tad. But at the same time, Congress and the politics that happens is so... Washington, D.C. is in such gridlock. And it seems like former President Trump is telling Republican leaders not to approve any more Ukrainian aid. And so maybe the president felt that this had to happen. Certainly, If more aid doesn't go there, especially modern anti-air missiles, far more civilians will die. The war will be prolonged. Putin would be emboldened, and none of that is good. So, no real news on the negotiations, and clearly if you're giving those kinds of briefings behind closed doors, it's... Either the final effort to try to get it over the finish line or it's the negotiations aren't going well. It's impossible to know, clearly. 
you can find links and all kinds of news that some people see make it seem like it's going to happen and some say there's no chance. So one other thing that's sort of negative, and then we'll get into some of the positive stuff, is the de- Defense Department said that because the money for Ukrainian aid from the U.S. has essentially run out and no more has been approved, that it's going to start affecting Ukraine and that some of the current systems that we've sent, such as Bradley's artillery pieces, other st- other type of U.S. equipment that we've sent, they're not going to be able to repair that equipment. And so that's going to start to create some issues. Now, clearly, Ukraine was a form- former communist bloc country, a former state of Ukraine that gained its independence, doesn't want to be a part of the Soviet Union, which turned into Russia. So they have their independence, but all of their weapon systems a few years ago were all based on Soviet model stuff. And we've been switching them over to Western and NATO modern equipment. But the problem is, is logistically it's been a nightmare for them because they're having to service two types of tanks, although it's actually worse than even that. But we'll just say Western and Eastern tanks. And the same thing with artillery and all the other types of weapons systems that they're fielding and air systems. And so the Defense Department said that it's they're beginning to have some issues with helping keeping those weapon systems in a, in a sustained ability to be used. So that is certainly not good. Now, let's counter all the bad news, and that is bad news. But it isn't just the U.S. that's helping Ukraine. Europe has really, really stepped up, especially in the interim in the past few months as the U.S. has really dragged its feet and shown, unfortunately, weakness by saying one thing and not being able to pull off some of our commitments. The first story I wanted to mention is that the European Union has announced a new plan for $22 billion in military support for Ukraine. And so the EU has been held up a bit by Hungary. Hungary is aligned with Russia, and they've been doing things to slow down and impede the EU from being able to supply Ukraine. Well, the EU has found a workaround where to avoid Hungary uh, holding up or halting some of these resupplies, the EU will reimburse member nations that supply military equipment and funding to Ukraine. And so it's a $22 billion plan over four years that looks like it's going to make its way through. So that's about $8 billion a year. That would be huge. And again, this is all planned around a design to get around Hungary's obstruction. And so these countries would distribute aids, aid by single states, and then they would be reimbursed by the EU. So essentially, it's just a, a legislative way to keep one member state from preventing the entire EU do, from doing what it wanted to do, minus one member state. So that's potentially good news. That could release some funds as well as some equipment. And not some, that's a lot, $8 billion a year. As of now, it looks like that's going to pass. Second bit of good news is we've talked a fair amount about Ukrainian forces having passed across the Dnipro River, and Russia has not been able to dislodge them. There was an update from the United Kingdom's military intelligence agency, and they went into a little bit of detail about how Russia continues to not be able to dislodge Ukrainian forces. So that's great news for Ukraine. I've clearly shared in some previous episodes that the fighting is horrendous. It's difficult for Ukrainian troops to dig in because it's swampy, so you start to dig and the water seeps up. It's horrendous fighting, but somehow Ukraine continues to hold on, although the United Kingdom's uh, intelligence agency does note that Ukraine is struggling with some logistical supply efforts to get supplies, ammo, etc. across the river. So they're definitely not advancing. Ukraine isn't advancing, but at the same time, Russia can't dislodge them. And it 
they did talk a bit, the United Kingdom's uh, intelligence agency, that Russia has put a lot of effort to try to push them back, and they just can't. The UK is saying, the United Kingdom is saying that the Russians are suffering from poor training, poor coordination, and it's uh, affecting their ability to conduct any kind of offensive uh, offensive a drive or attack in that area to dislodge the Ukrainians. So, but again, we're now three, four weeks into January, three weeks, I guess. We've had pretty much nothing but bad news about that river crossing for the past five or six weeks, but bad news or not, the Ukrainians are holding on. So Russia clearly wants to dislodge them and Russia clearly can't. Now, the other pretty big good news story for Ukraine is the Ukrainians launched a drone attack inside Russia in one of the neighboring provinces, setting off four different oil storage depots. So this is like 1.6 million gallons were set on fire from this drone attack. Again, this is about 40 miles from the Ukrainian border. You can read a little bit about this in the episode notes. Also put in a uh, YouTube video. You can watch this pretty massive fire. So that's a pretty big hit for Russia. And Ukraine is it continuing to try to use, we've talked about sabotage, but also drones to attack targets inside Russia so that Russia gets a taste of its own medicine as Russia continues to launch ballistic missiles into Ukrainian cities. Ukraine is showing them that they cannot continue to invade and attack Ukraine without suffering some similar results. Now I want to share one other great thing. Let's move to last week we talked about Ukraine had shot down some planes. They have again shot down another major large plane inside Russia. Russia is saying Ukraine shot it down with missiles. Ukraine admits that its air defenses were active. This was a uh, transport plane. Had 74 Uh, people on board, according to Russia. Now, Russia, of course, I barely believe anything Russia says. Russia says that there were dozens of Ukrainian service members on board that were being transported for a prisoner swap. I'm a little skeptical of that, just because Russia typically puts out information that's false on a regular basis. I'm also a little skeptical because Ukrainian intelligence is pretty good. And I'd like to think if there were actual Ukrainian prisoners of war on there, Ukraine would have known about it. Ukraine is saying that, again, that their air defenses were active and that these planes, military aircraft approaching this um, province of Belgorod are legitimate targets or legitimate targets because they've been supplying weapons very close to the border and that the shelling has been directly linked to these planes and so Ukraine wanted to stop the military transport aircraft operating in the area and so that's their take on it. Now let's move to some more good news. This is the kind of thing that of course didn't make the news but to me is a pretty big story. The United States and France are trying to create an what they're calling an artillery coalition for Ukraine. So Ukraine had already ordered six Caesar howitzers. Now, these are the howitzers that they're basically on the back of this multi-wheeled, not tank, not really a truck. It's kind of a thinly armored vehicle, very large. It can roll up to an area, stop, raise its cannon, fire multiple times, lower and move before the rounds even strike so that the Russians can't fire back. So it's, you know, what the military calls shoot and move. These are very devastating weapons. And in many ways, they're better than the U.S. ones where we've we've provided a lot of towed artillery where you pull up a piece of artillery on the back of a truck, you stop the truck, you have to spin the artillery around, unhook it, fire. It takes, you know, three to five minutes to get that thing back hooked up and moved. So these Caesar howitzers are in many ways far superior because they can shoot and move faster. So the company that makes this can make up to 72 of these things per year. Ukraine, as I said, has ordered 
six of them. So France is trying to lead a coalition with the U.S. to get other European countries to buy more of these self-propelled guns for Ukraine to use. Now, since that company can make, uh, the number was 72, I believe. Yes, 72 of those trucks. And since Ukraine has already ordered six, France is going to pay for itself 12 more for Ukraine. And then they're trying to get the uh, other European countries to buy 60 more of them, as well as ammunition. So that would be 72. Again, Ukraine's already ordered six of them, which they're supposed to get in the coming weeks. So that would be 72 plus 6, that's 78. And you get 78 of these self-propelled guns, 155 millimeter, very long range howitzers. That's the kind of thing that can really, really begin to shift how things are going on the battlefield. One other part from that story that I did want to share is that French production of the 155 millimeter shells has it has been accelerating, and it doubled from last year. It was doing a thousand a month in February 2022. They're now up to three thousand a month. So. Slowly but surely, the West, which has mostly been caught flat-footed on its ability to pr produce artillery rounds, is starting to catch up, is starting to increase its production. And this is good news for the defense of Ukraine. It's good news for the economy. It's good news, you know, for decades people said, oh, we don't produce anything in the West anymore, so we're starting to relearn and those skills that we used to have. We're starting to get the kinds of pr uh, production equipment that we need. Even in the U.S., in Pennsylvania, there's a place making 155 millimeter shells. It's going to 24-hour production. They're hiring people. In Florida, the place where they make Patriot missile parts, they're up to like 24-hour shifts, three shifts of eight hours. So this is very important because for a long time, the West has kind of exported its production to other places, which is not good, clearly. So the overall news, though, is that France and many countries in the EU are continuing to try to arm Ukraine. And especially, I was just really excited to see the news that the thought of Ukraine getting potentially up to 70, 78 or 80, you know, 76, whatever that number was of these self-propelled howitzers. That's the kind of thing that could really start to change the way things look in Ukraine. Now, one final weapons type update for Ukraine is the Pentagon did announce that Ukraine could receive its first F-16 fighters as well as the spare parts and infrastructure this year, this year being 2024. So that's good news. So far there are apparently, you, you get lots of different information on this, but the story that the, the U.S. Defense Department released stated that there are at least six Ukrainian pilots that are that have completed basic training with the United Kingdom's Royal Air Force to fly the F-16. And they're currently flying them in Denmark. So, of course, this is happening across multiple countries. There's been talk that it's happening some in the U.S. I think they'll never really release how many pilots are actually being trained because Russia would be dying to know that. Now, if you have no idea what we're talking about as far as F-16s, that's a older fighter of the U.S. and the West, there are lots of them that aren't used very much across both the West, meaning Europe, and the United States. So it's a kind of airframe that Ukraine is really wanting to get its hands on, and it's far superior to most of what the Russians have. So it will do a lot to help secure Ukrainian airspace, to help some of the air-to-ground attacks. So definitely good news. It's just unfortunately taken so long to get F-16s there. It should have been started way sooner. But for months and months, if not more than a year, the West has been very concerned about antagonizing Russia. And Russia has thrown out lots of very crazy threats that they've never backed up. And so it's taken us a long time to get here, which is unfortunate. But we're finally getting there. So I guess better late than never. One final thing and we'll move off of Ukraine. Just literally one sentence here. The Turkish parliament approved Sweden's NATO membership bid. So that's big. 
that's been held up for a long time by Erdogan, the leader of Turkey, who's kind of a rabble rouser and not always a big supporter of the West. He kind of flirts with Putin a lot, but he's he's definitely a strong man, but it has finally gone through the Turkish parliament. So that's big news, and that's going to help NATO again get larger and stronger as Sweden gets one step closer to finally being a full NATO member. So good news there. All right, so we're going to get into the best part of the show, which is the motivation and inspiration section. But before we do, just a quick reminder, if you want to help support the show, you can do so for $5 per month. You can do that from the Substack page or on Patreon. It's a great way to help support the show, and I really appreciate everyone who is already paying to help support. Of course, so far at least, we have no corporate sponsors or anything like that, so it's just a kind of underground effort from folks who want to who enjoy the show, get something from it, etc. So thanks all for all the folks out there already helping. If you're getting something from it and you want to help, that'd be awesome. As I always say, you can come and go as you wish. I don't keep up with that stuff, or I try not to. And so, again, you can find all that stuff in the episode notes, so thanks for even considering it. Alright, so best part of the show. Apologies while I get the link set up. So, this is the motivation and inspiration section. I share them every week because I think all of us could use a few words of encouragement. So, all of us matter. All of us can infect those people around us with a little bit more energy, with motivation, by sharing, you know, just just set an example, saying a few of the right words. I feel like all of us can use just a little bit more. We can all up our game. And so that's what I try to do every week. I try to share some things that hopefully just give you a little bit of fuel. They, you know, some people say motivation doesn't last and that's true. It's like bathing. You got to do it on a regular basis. So I'm hoping some of these feed you. So here's the first one. Optimism is the faith that leads to achievement. Nothing can be done without hope and confidence. So that's a quote from Helen Keller. Again, optimism is the faith that leads to achievement. Nothing can be done without hope and confidence. It's pretty good. Nothing can be done without hope and confidence. Optimism or being optimistic is the faith that leads to achievement. Got to stay optimistic. Got to keep believing, right? Even when it doesn't look good. Keep believing. All right, here's the next one. Be so positive that negative people do not want to be near you. That's pretty good. Be so positive that negative people do not want to be near you. We don't want negative people near us anyway, right? We don't spread the lot, but we don't want people dragging us down. Some people just can't, can't get them out of the ditch. They're just People, there's some people that just thrive on drama and negativity, it seems like. But I know it's good to help, so I'm not saying don't help people, but don't don't let, you know, like just like if you see someone drowning in a pool, you don't want to drown with them. You want to help them, but you can't drown with them. All right, the next quote is one from Aristotle. The purpose of knowledge is action, not knowledge. Oh, we know people like that, don't we? Again, the quote is, the purpose of knowledge is action, not knowledge. Don't we all know that person who reads too much or goes to school too much or always planning and studying and they just don't take the step? It's the wrong way, according to Aristotle. The purpose of knowledge is action, not knowledge. All right, here's the next one. Nothing will work unless you do. (laughs) That's pretty good. Nothing will work unless you do. Next one. All big things started small. All big things started small. Next one. Failure doesn't mean the game is over. It means try again with experience. Man, that's a good one. Failure doesn't mean the game is over. It means try again with experience. Next one. This is a quote from Michael Jordan. Some people want it to happen. Some wish it would happen. Others make it happen. Some people want it to happen. Some wish it would happen. Others make it happen. Next one. Be careful of your thoughts. Even your own mind will try to stop you. Man, that's good. Be careful of your thoughts. Even your own mind will try to stop you. 
Do not listen to your doubts, right? Next one. Try and fail, but never fail to try. Again, try and fail, but never fail to try. Next one. Be thankful for the struggles you go through. They make you stronger, wiser, and humble. Don't let them break you. Let them make you. Man, that's good. Be thankful for the struggles you go through. They make you stronger, wiser, and humble. Don't let them break you. Let them make you. It's pretty good. Now, I always like to share a few from the Bible just because that book has become such a source of strength and inspiration and wisdom and calm for me this past year. So here's the first one. This is from Proverbs 16, chapter 16, verse 9. In their hearts, humans plan their course but the Lord establishes their steps. That's good. In their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. Next one. This is from Romans chapter 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, that one is, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, that's Romans 15, verse 13. All right, so I always like to end with this one. Be the reason someone smiles. Be the reason someone feels loved and believes in the goodness of people. I mean, that's a good goal, right? Now, like I always say, regardless of your faith, be a decent human being, love your neighbor as yourself, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So, hey, thanks for joining us on this episode. I hope you're proud of our country. I know we're not perfect, but I'm still so proud of it, and I hope you are too. As you go through this week, remember it's easy to be divisive. It's easy to argue with people on social media. Don't do that. Just be that wet blanket that when they're fired up, You just help calm them down. A lot of people who watch a lot of news, they hear nothing but negative stuff about the other side. They hear the country's coming to an end. They hear the worst stuff. Just help them calm down. They need it. I always like to tell people, remember that most Americans are good. Don't ever forget that. And in times of adversity, whether it's like a natural disaster or anything like that, or a war where another country attacks us, we always come together. So we have to hang together. The only way we're going to pass on to our grandkids and future generations what was handed to us is if we believe in the goodness of Americans, if we hold this stuff together. So don't let loud talking heads convince you that our best days are behind us don't believe that we got to stay optimistic and we got to pull together now i'd like to finish with just a couple of last things a bit about myself and my books and then i always like to mention ptsd if you've never heard the episode before know nothing about me just a bit about me i'm a military vet i spent four years in the marine corps all of that time in the infantry after my enlistment i went to college i became a journalist spent more than 10 years in the news business Besides all that, I've written 12 books. They include a series about a Marine Corps sniper, several police detective novels, and a few books about war, such as World War II and Afghanistan. So all of those are self-published. You can find all of them on Amazon. Just search my name, Stan R. Mitchell, or just check the episode notes. Thanks to your guys' help, I've sold 70,000 copies. So there's no big publisher behind me. They're pretty good books. They're highly rated would not have sold 70,000 copies if they weren't good. So, again, you can find them on Amazon. It's a great way to support the show, great way to support a vet and a guy. I think he's a pretty decent dude. I don't know. (laughs) I'll let you guys be the judge of that. Now, I always like to end talking about PTSD, though, because vets are at a 57% higher risk of suicide than civilians their same age. But... I try to say every week, this isn't just for veterans. If you're in the ditch, if you're in a low spot of life, hopefully something I can say might make an impact. First, I want to remind you that it's a season. It's a valley. I think that's important for you to remember. But if you're having serious issues, 
you can call 988-SELECT-1. Whether you're a veteran or not a veteran, you can talk to a crisis line responder 24-7. So again, that number is 988-SELECT-1. If you're having serious issues, I beg of you to call it. But I also know you probably won't call it. I don't know why it is, but for whatever reason, we struggle to reach out for help. Do we not? And so I want to give some suggestions, some encouragement, and also some tough love. Because for whatever reason, sometimes tough love is what we need to hear. So what I want to say is you can't lose this fight. You can't let this low situation that you may be in make you do something that it would be the worst mistake a person can make. So I like to remind people that we get so into the moment, so short-term thinking that we're not thinking long-term, but I don't want you to make that mistake. And I like to say, you need to think about what happens if you make that mistake. And it sounds cold or cruel, but I want to reach people and I want you to not make that mistake. And unfortunately, a lot of people do succumb to suicide and so we can't we have to stop that the military the government they're not going to help you they can't for whatever reason they've been trying for decades to help find ways to deal with ptsd and there's i don't know if the answers aren't out there i'm not sure but you have to think about what happens if you make that mistake and i like to say do not make your parents or your family have to plan your funeral and sometimes it's thinking about your loved ones that I think helps get you through that. Don't make them feel guilty that they didn't check on you, that they couldn't reach you. Don't leave wife or kids out there. I think you're stronger than that. I think you can hold on for another day. I promise you the next day will be a little easier. I know I've struggled with some mental stuff. It's just getting through that bad day. It's just getting to the next day, and it gets easier, and you get adjusted a little better if you're a military person who's exit his service. You just got, you cannot lose the fight. You got to make it to the next day. Again, you can call 988, select one, but I just don't want you to let the devil convince you that no one's going to miss you, that no one cares. If you have some other kind of faith, lean on it. If you have no faith at all, you know, I beg of you to reach out to God or consider it. You can find the Bible on, online. You can find Bible apps. Start reading the Bible. I think that has helped me a ton, so I like to mention that. You could definitely reach out to God at any time. You don't even need that. You can just pray. You can close your eyes and pray. But no matter what, you can't freaking quit, and you can't do this to your family and friends. If you have no family, if you have no friends, and you're super isolated, again, you're in a, like, a bad season. You're in a bad moment. But it's a valley. It's a season. you got to think more long-term. I think you got a future family out there waiting for you. I think you got a future spouse, future kids. It's out there, but you're just so like in the moment. It just doesn't, you just can't get through it. Got to think long term sometimes. You got to stay positive, but don't think short term. And I'm serious. Don't make your family, don't make your friends have to plan your funeral. It's the worst thing you can do. And unfortunately, it kind of gives permission to your other military vets to do the same thing because they're like, oh, so-and-so, that's one of the strongest dudes I know or strongest women I know. They, they couldn't handle it. Stop. Let it stop with you. Be the strong one. I always like to remind people, because I've just gone through this a year ago, but who is going to take care of your parents in 30 years if you make the mistake if you give up and that's something you got to think about i helped my mom last year i'm helping my dad now who's going to take care of them like you, you cannot make this mistake so i'm saying don't you dare quit don't make the mistake there's something you're meant to do you haven't found it yet probably dealing with some short-term things like alcohol maybe even some pills to help you get through you just can't see the end result. You're in a tough valley, but I believe there's a mission for you. Maybe it's to help the poor, maybe help others with PTSD, maybe help unite the country, maybe run for government office someday, help us tackle our debt. Maybe it's to inspire some kid out there, maybe coach Little League Baseball, help with a football team. 
get involved, stop isolating yourself, join or visit a veterans group, such as like Veterans of the Foreign Wars, VFW, there are Marine groups, there's all kinds of groups. Go to a church, visit churches near you. Reach out to some family or friends you haven't talked to in a bit. Don't isolate yourself. You isolate yourself, just like in the military, you, you gotta have, I think they call them battle buddies now, but whatever the term is they're using these days, you got to be part of a unit. You got to be part of a team. It makes it easier. I know you can do this. You can't give up. I always like to share a couple of examples I found online. If you're struggling, it's hard to reach out. I get it. Like, what do you say to someone, especially if they're civilian? They don't really totally relate to what we've been through. Here's a couple of examples. Text someone. This is, here's the first example. Quote, put it in a text. This is really hard for me to say, but I'm having painful thoughts and it might help to talk. Are you free? 100% guarantee you send that to a friend or family member, they're there, guaranteed. Here's another one. I'm struggling right now and just need to talk to someone. Can we chat? That's all you got to do. But no matter what, be a warrior. Do not let the enemy win. Hold on a little longer. You can do this. You can do this. Do not give up. Finally, if you're doing fine, I challenge you. Reach out to someone you haven't talked to in a while, someone who may be struggling, especially if it's a military friend. You know, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes, I always like to share this, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better because a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Just as that verse says, we serve as the hands of God. Reach out to someone. Don't even have to have faith to be that way. You Just be a good person. But reach out to someone. It'll be good for you. It'll be good for them. But again, if you're struggling, don't give up. And you can call the number 988-SELECT-1 or start moving toward God. I even have something in the episode notes, a link. If you want to read something that I've written that helps some people, it's a little article. That, uh, it's a link in the episode notes. It's called Be Like Ozzy. Go near your master. Ozzy's the name of my dog. But it's a pretty good article, I think. Might help you. Again, don't give up. That's the bottom line. Now, if you want to reach out to me, you can reach out to me privately. My email is authorstanrmitchell at yahoo.com. Again, authorstanrmitchell at yahoo.com. You can say hi. You can vent. You can send news tips. If you're struggling, you can reach out to me. I'll do my best to answer. I try to keep up with all of the emails that come in. Also, I'd like to mention, if you love my moderate, optimistic view of politics, I write about politics some. It's uh, called uh, Thoughts from a Southern Gentleman. Apologies. Total brain. My brain just went away for a second. But I try to write optimistic articles that are full of con- kindness and hope. So sign up for that if you want to. Either way, thanks for hanging with me. It's an honor to have you guys listen every week. Love hearing from you. Drop a comment. Send me an email. Love each of you. But remember that God loves you more. So I'll catch you next week. Again, my name is Stan, and this is The View from the Front. <laughs>